Hello, this uh, video is to serve as a preview for the course of Advanced Placement uh, Statistics and uh, what we're going to be looking at in this video is a, is a preview mostly to, to Chapter 1, so hopefully this will give you a little bit of a head start of the content and when we cover it more in-depthly during the school year it won't uh, be quite as, uh, quite as hard for you. And um, so uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is describing uh, quantitative data. Quantitative data is data that's based basically numbers uh, when you see them. Um, and then the other kind of data we're going to look at in a minute is categorical data, which categorizes things. So for example, in regards to people, quantitative data are numbers that describe us, such as maybe our height or our weight or possibly a test score or something like that. Categorical data, as the name implies, is variables that categorize us, maybe what state we were born in, what race we are, uh, what religion we are, all that sort of thing. So. Um, Anyway, but first of all, um, in regards to quantitative data, we're going to make some different kinds of graphs. And I want to demonstrate a couple of them today, a dot plot, um, and then we'll also make a box plot, otherwise known as a box and whisker plot. And we will also have to be, you'll also have to be able to draw a stem and leaf plot, which we're not going to cover here, but, and then also a histogram, which we're not going to cover here. But So first of all, let's look at this context. It says that a farmer has a, um, has a large field in which he grows carrots. He wishes to study the lengths of his carrots, so he takes a random sample of 16 of them and gets these weights below. And so draw, draw a dot uh, box or draw a dot plot of this data and describe it. So this is sort of the heart of chapter one really is, is cussing is what we say. Um, and cussing means is whenever you're asked to describe a distribution of quantitative data, just a list of numbers, whenever you're asked to describe it, you describe its center, does it have unusual values, which we call outliers, um, and it's, its shape and its spread. So a dot plot um, is just simply a number line with dots above it. And so what we'll do is we are gonna, we're gonna draw just a little number line and our numbers are going from 12 to 30. So I'll just, um, I'll say, well, I'll just go 10 and go in units of five, let's say that ought to work. So 20, 25, and then 30 and then 35, and then 40. That'll cover the data. So that is um, that is labeling my axes or scaling it. Um, now to actually label it is I've got to say what these is, and these are carrot lengths. So always label and scale yeah, your axes. So carrot lengths, and these are in millimeters. And always put your units. So there we go. And we just put dots above it. So uh, we have 12 twice. So 12 is about there. It doesn't have this. Doesn't have to be a perfect graph. The whole purpose is to understand in general what's happening with the data. And so we are making a dot plot. So 15 and 15. And then 16, 17, 18. So 16, 17, 18. And uh, and then two 19s. So two 19s. Then we have a 20 and a 22, a 23 a 27, a 30, and a 36, and there we go. And so we have thus, uh, we have thus graphed the data. Um, and so now we're gonna describe it. And so the first thing you have to do in regards to cussing is you have to state what you think its center is. And you would just look basically in the middle. Well, and when you look in the middle of this data, sort of the average of it is somewhere around 20. And so it's somewhere around 20. And you would, you would write sentences out. When you're asked to describe it, you would say the center appears to be around 20, and you would write those words. So is there unusual values? So is there unusual, unusual values, otherwise known as outliers? All right, and outliers are just points that are unusual relative to the other pattern. And I would say this 36 and this 30 might be outliers. They're sort of unusual. I mean, you're always gonna have some that are on the edge, but unusual means, whoa, that one's really out there, and we'll have a formula for that later on. So, so for, for that one, you would say there might be an outlier at 30 and at 36. All right, and in regards to the shape, and we're not gonna get into that in depth in here, is, but you're gonna talk about, is it symmetrical? Does it look the same on the right as it does on the left? And it really doesn't here, all right? Or is it gonna be skewed? Now, skewed to the right, and I would say this is, skewed to the right means it has, in essence, a tail going to the right, and a, and a box plot will help us this, uh, with this. So I would, I would say this is a bit skewed to the right or skewed to the left. Um, we'll also talk about, is it bimodal? And this is a really small data set, it's really not bimodal means it has more uh, modes or places where it kind of sticks up. Um, or is it uniform means it just, just goes straight across. So we'll get more in depth into that later. But the, but the other thing that you need to talk about is its spread. 
And so it's spread, all right, here, you could say the numbers vary from 12 to 36. All right, so the numbers vary from 12 to 36. And so that would be fully describing a distribution. It's center, it's unusual value, it's shape, and it's spread. And we'll be a little more definite about these. Now, so also this, all right, so find the two measures of center, the mean and the median. Those are the two main measures of center. There's also others measures of center, such as the mode, which would be the number that occurs most often. The mid-range is also another one that we really don't deal with. But the two main ones we, we deal with are mean and median. And we would include that in our description if we were asked to do it, okay? So, in other words, we would say, well, the center is described by the mean of this and the median of that. And so, in regards to the mean of these numbers, um, so all you would have to do is that's just the average. You just add them up and divide by the total number of numbers. And so we will refer to that, the mean, we will label that as an X bar. We're saying this is a sample value. So it can also, a mean can also be labeled with the Greek letter mu. It'd be a population value, but both of these are means. But since this is in essence a sample, we call it an X bar. And so we get that this mean is 19.6875. <clears throat> and so that would be our first measure of center. Now, how do you find the median? The median is the number that's in the middle. The number that's in the middle. So in this case, we've got 16 numbers, so we could just count from the outside and find the number in the middle. And if there's two numbers in the middle, you average them. So we'll count from the outside. We go one, and then two, and then three, three, four, four, five, five, six, six, seven, seven, and then it should be eight. Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's two numbers in the middle, unless I miscounted these things. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, we have two numbers in the middle. So our median is the average of those two numbers. So our median is equal to 18.5. So those are the numbers that describe the center, the measures of central tendency. All right, we've got three big numbers that describe spread. The range, the interquartile range, the IQR, and the standard deviation. We aren't gonna find the standard deviation right now, but um, other, the, the two numbers that define spread are the range. The range is just the largest minus the smallest, the max minus the min. So in regards to the range, it's just in this data set, it's gonna be 36 minus 12, and so that's, um, that would be equal to 24. And so that is, uh, and so that is our range. Um, and then the interquartile range. All right, the interquartile range. In order to find them, the IQR, it is defined as the third quartile minus the first quartile. And you say that well, this is what is known as the upper quartile, and this is the lower quartile. And you say, well, how do you how do you find those? Q3, the upper quartile, is just the median of the upper half of numbers. Q1, the lower quartile, is the median of the lower half of numbers. And it is a measure of spread. So Q3, so what you do is you take the upper half of numbers. Now, and so you only take one of the numbers in the middle. The upper half of numbers is these eight numbers. Now, by the way, if there had been just one number in the middle, for instance, if we'd had 17 numbers here, and there had been one number in the middle, you would not include that, that middle number in your calculation. But since there, if there's two numbers in the middle, you include one of them. And so we'll find the median of these numbers. So we count from the outsides, one, two, and then three, three, four. There's two numbers in the middle there, 22 and 23. So Q3 is the average of those two numbers in the middle. So, um, and so that'd be 22.5. And so this would be 22.5. And then Q1's the median of the lower half of numbers, which once again, there's two numbers in the middle, 15. Well, the average of that is 15. So Q1 is 15. And so we subtract those two. The IQR is 7.5. That is in essence the variability of the middle 50% of numbers, but it is a measure of spread. And so when we're cussing, when we're describing a distribution, we have numbers to describe the center and the spread. And so we could, if we were saying this more completely here, we would say the center of these numbers is described by the mean of 19.6875 and the median of 18.5. The spread is described by a range of 24 and an IQR 7.5, and we'll also find uh, the standard deviation. 
All right, now I'm gonna go, you, you do need to know how to do that stuff by hand like I just did. I'm gonna show you how, your, how you could do that with your calculator. Um, and so let me show you that. So what you can do if you have a TI-84 and if you have another type of calculator, we can work with that. But um, so what you could do to find what is known as your summary stats, and those numbers are summary stats, is we're gonna put our numbers in a list. And so we're gonna hit our stat button right there. So we hit stat. And we hit enter on edit. Enter's in the lower, whenever I say enter, it means that number on the, uh, that button on the lower right. So we hit enter, and then you just enter your numbers there. So into list one, L1, which is list one. Now to get my summary stats, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hit the stat button again, and I'm gonna go, and then I arrow over to calculate one variable stats. We'll never do two variable stats, by the way. One variable stat, so I hit enter on that. And so, and I'm gonna put list one there. Let's say it doesn't say anything. So the list that I put everything is in list one. List one is right above the one button right there. So I'm gonna go hit the, hit the second button, which uh, puts me above the key. So second and go list one there. And then the frequency list, leave it blank. Okay, or you could put a one there, but it, it, it'll mess you up if you put anything else. And so calculate, and so it'll give me my summary stats, and so I've got the wrong data in there. I apologize for that. Let me, let me change my data. I forgot that I had changed this, so this should be a 36 there. So I have the right data in now. So now I can do this. Stat, calculate, uh, one variable stats, this one, and then do, and so there's my mean. The X bar is the mean. We'll never use this, the sum of the X, the sum of the X squareds. This S is what we call the standard deviation. It's the average amount the points vary from the middle in general. Um, and that's another measure of standard deviation, that sigma sub X, which we'll never use. Then if you scroll down here, it gives you what is known as the five number summary, the minimum value, the lower quartile, the median, the upper quartile, and the max. And those are handy for us. And those are the numbers that we can use to draw a box plot, which is the next, which is the next thing. So the next thing we're going to do is draw a box plot, otherwise known as a box and wishka plot. And so the way you do that is you just draw a number line. And so our numbers are varying from 10 to 36 again. So I would, I'm from 12 to 36. So I'll go from 10, just like I did before, 15, and then 20, 25, 30, 35, and 40. And what we're gonna to use to draw a box plot is what is known as the five number summary. The five number summary. The five number summary are your min, Q1, the median, otherwise known as Q2, Q3, and the max. Those are my five number summaries. So the minimum value of this data set is 12. So I'll put a dot above 12, above the line like that. And then Q1, as we discussed up here, Q1 is 15. So I'll put a dot at 15. And then uh, the median is 18.5. So 18.5 is about right there, I would say. And then Q3 is 22.5. So I go to 22.5, that's like right there. And then lastly, the max is 36, which that's way up here. All right, so once you put your five dots, all right, what you do is you put a box through Q1 and Q3, like that. You put whiskers going from your quartiles out to your extrema, to your min and to your max, and then you put a vertical line segment through Q2. And that's what we call a box plot. Now, by the way, if two of the numbers had been the same, like let's say if the min and both the min and Q1 had been 15, you'd just put one dot there for them, and so you wouldn't have a whisker on the left side. Or like let's say your median and Q1 had been 15, then you wouldn't have a, a line segment in the middle. You just have one dot, and so you just have four dots there. But this uh, one of the things a box and whisker plot allows us to do it allows us to easily see skewness, and. Um, this data we would say is skewed to the right because notice how much bigger the right whisker is to the left. Now the other ways we can draw, uh, uh, see skewness is if the right and the left side of the box, which they're the same here. Um, so anyway, so that's how you draw. That's how you draw a box plot. All right. Then the next thing we're going to determine is: Are there any outliers? Outliers, like we, like I said, is in un unusual points relative to the others. And so the question is. Is this so unusual that um, we would call this an outlier? And the way we officially define outliers is this. An outlier, so an outlier, there's two types, on the high end and on the low end, 
is going to be anything that is greater than Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR. And this formula is not going to be given to you, more than likely. It's not on your formula sheet, which we'll talk about that in later videos. But um, um, So you just have to memorize this. Q3 plus 1.5 times IQR, or anything less than Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. That's our official definition of outlier. So it's all dependent upon the quartiles. So let's calculate that. It's all dependent upon these two numbers. So on the high side, it's anything greater than, so that would be 22.5, and then plus 1.5 times our IQR, which is 7.5, times 7.5. And that, so that in fact, and so that in fact is 33.75. So that is 33.75. So anything greater than 33.75 is an outlier. That means this 36 is an outlier. So we would so we would say therefore 36 is an outlier. Okay, and then also on the low end, Q1, well Q1 is 15. So this would be 15 minus 1.5 times the IQR, which is 7.5, and so that when you so that would be 3.75. So anything less than 3.75 is an outlier. So those, and there's nothing that is that is less than that. So there's not an outlier on the low side. So that is how you uh, that is how you calculate um, that is how you calculate outliers. And the last thing I want to say about this data set is what happens. So let's let, uh, as it turns out, the carrot that is listed as 30, uh, 36. Uh, millimeters long was measured incorrectly. It is actually 66 millimeters long. So this thing up here, we're going to change this. What if this is 66? Well, it's definitely an outlier now. All right. Um, now find the summary stats as for number two and number three. What happens to them as a result? So this is an important concept. What happens to the mean, median, and your uh, and, you know IQR, standard deviation range? What happens to those numbers when you have an outlier like this? when you have a really unusual value. And so we'll go ahead and do that with our calculator. And so with our calculator, if we go stat and then hit edit, and I'm gonna just go to the bottom and change that to a 66. All right, now let's see what happens to our summary stats. Now let me write them down here. So our mean, our X bar up here, and so that one is 19.6875. And our median, our median is 18.5. And then our measures of spread, those are our measures of center. Our, our range, our range is equal to 24. Our IQR is equal to 7.5. And then our standard deviation, and did I write that down? Well, it in fact was equal to 6.64. 05, I do believe. That was our standard deviation of our first data set when we had 36 in it. Let's see what happens when we change this to a 66. So I've changed that to a 66. Now let's do one variable stats. So I do stat, calculate, one variable stats of list one, frequency, leave it blank, and hit calculate. And so now our mean goes up to 21.5625. So our mean, our X bar, uh, our new X bar, I'll call this sub one, X bar sub two. And so this would be 21.5625, all right? Notice though, our median is exactly the same. Our median is exactly the same, 18.5. And so our median does not change, even with an outlier. So that would be 18.5. All right, then if we scroll down here, our, our range is now, our max minus our, our min, it, it is now 50, so our range goes up, not surprisingly. So our range goes up, but our IQRs, the, our quartiles do not cha uh, change. So our IQR, that is equal to 7.5, and then our standard deviation, our S goes up a lot, 12.87 approximately. So our standard deviation is 12.87. So, but the key thing here is this, notice how the median and the IQR do not change with an outlier. They do not change with an outlier like that. That is what we call resistance. They are resistance to outliers and strong skewness. So whenever you have a distribution that has an outlier that is really skewed like this, um, it's a frequent question is, what is the best measures for center and spread? And the best measures for center and spread with a skewed distribution 
is the median and the, out, uh, and the IQR because they are resistant. Okay, of course, we're going to talk about all this in depthly in the course. Um, and uh, so there we go. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about in this video is when we have categorical data. All this, uh, all, so that is basically what you have to be able to do uh, with quantitative data. So let's talk about categorical data. So uh, categorical data is something that it categorizes. It, it, it is, it is num the numbers are counts in categories, okay? So um, that can't be decimals like they typically can be with quantitative data. So in this case, it says, uh, the manager of a restaurant wishes to see if there's a relationship between the gender of the customers at her restaurant and their opinion about the new salad bar there. She takes a random sample of 225 customers and gets these results. So you've got males and females, and you've got their opinion of the salad bars, either great, good, fair, or poor. And so um, this is what we call a two-way table. And whenever you're given a two-way table, what I encourage you to do is come up with the, what is known as the marginal distributions. In other words, we need to see the total number of the opinions. Well, the total number of great, when you add those up, that's 74. The total number that said good is 54. The total number that said fair is 39. And the total number that uh, said poor is 58. When you add those up, you get the total number in the table and so that's 225. Then the total number of males, if you go 12 plus 16 plus 21 plus 46, there's 95 males. And the total number of females, when you add all those up, is there's a total of 130, and that adds up to 225 as well. So, um, and so we could be, well, we're gonna be asking questions later on that we'll have to use that. So draw a graph. Now there's only one graph for, cat there's really, really only one graph we're gonna use for categorical data, and that's what we call a bar graph. Um, and there's kind of a couple different kinds of bar graphs. We're gonna, you can have a segment of bar graph, which we're not gonna do here. We're gonna do a side-by-side -side bar graph. And with quantitative data, which we just did, we've got four or five different kinds of graphs. We got, we got you know, dot plots, box plots, stem plots, histograms, and then a couple of others. But, um, but uh, we, we could do a pie chart as well, but we're, that's kind of rarely done. But the main thing is to do a bar graph. In order to do a bar graph, we need percents in the different categories. Okay, I could do bars with these numbers, but the problem is there's a different number of males and females. And the whole purpose of this is I want to compare the relationship between people's gender. You know, does, is people gender, is it related to their opinion? That's what's being asked here. And so in order to do that, we need to look at what is known as the conditional distribution. Conditional distribution means to make percents out of the data. So I'm not just, I'm not interested so much in the number of males that said great, I want the percent of males that said great, or the proportion. And so we would say, well, so we'll divide this in essence, uh, divide this in the male row, divide by column, so to speak. And so the percent of males that said great, well, that's gonna be 12 out of 95. And so that would give me 0.126. Okay, now you could divide it like this. You could divide it, you know, in the, in the great column and divide it by row in essence, which would be 12 over 74. That would be the percent of those that said great that are male. And so you kind of have a choice and it's kind of whichever way you want to do it. But, um, and so the percent of males that said good, that's 16 out of 95. And so that's 0.168. And the percent of males that said fair, 21 out of 95. And so that's 0.221. The percent of males that said poor, 46 out of 95. And that's 0.484. And then what about the females? What percent of females said great? 62 out of 130. And so that's 0.477 and uh, what percent said good? 38 out of 130, and so that is 0.292. What percent said fair? And that's 18 out of 130, and that's 0.138. And what percent said poor? That's 12 out of 30, which is 0 0.0923, I do believe. Okay, and now we can make a bar graph. And so what we'll do is we will go like this. And so we will put, and you kind of have some options here. So this is always going to be, uh, in essence, you know, the percent, the percent of the people. And the high, what's the highest percent? The highest percent goes up to like 48%. So I'll just go like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, and that will uh, cover all of them like that. And so then what we'll do is I will, here's the ones that said great. Here's the one that said, 
the ones that said good, here's the one that said fair, and here's the one that said poor. And so my bars for male, I'll leave that with open like that. So those will be the males. And then the filled in bar will be females. We'll make a side by side bar graph like that. And so for the males, so this is about less than 13%. So it doesn't have to be perfect. We want to in general see what's happening with the data. That's the whole deal. And so the females is all the way up at 48%. So that's way up here. It's a lot higher percent. So if you didn't convert these to percents, you wouldn't get as good a look at this. And so for good, the males is up to about 17%. So it's a little bit higher in that first one. And then uh, that's up to 30%. So that's like up to there. So that's for female. And then for fair, 22% for the male. So that's fair. And then for the females, 14% roughly. So that's somewhere down in here like that. And then lastly, uh, for the poor, for the males, 48%, so that's way up there. And then for the females, it's uh, 9%, so that's way down here. And, so, and then we can make our comparison. And so, you know, with quantitative data, we cussed. We talked about center, unusual value, shape, and spread. But with categorical data, you just describe what you see. You just look at it, and you just sort of eyeball it, and you say, well... The, the females are much more likely to rate the salad bar as great or good, whereas the males are much more likely to rate the salad bar as fair or poor. And that's it. That's all you have to be able to do uh, to describe uh, categorical data. Then I, I wanted to include a couple of probability problems uh, that could be asked with a two-way table, which is more of a kind of a chapter four thing, but uh, this is sort of a preview of that. Um, so it, it says this, if you were to randomly select someone from this table, find the probability they are a male that rated poor. So the way you calculate a probability is you say, well, what is the number that are males that said poor? Well, males that said poor was 46. And you put that over the total number of possibilities, which is 225. So if you were to randomly select one of the people on this table, in other words, you were to select them in such a way that everybody's equally likely to be chosen, it'd be 46 out of 225. And you can just leave it like that, okay? As it turns out, that is equal to 0.204 repeating. But don't just write the decimal. You don't have to write the decimal. You get full credit for that, and that's considered showing your work is writing the fraction like that. All right, then we have this. So then we have, what's the probability if you randomly select someone from the table, they're male given they were rated poor. Now, given means, in essence, if only you if only you look at this group, if you only look at the group that said poor. So, in other words, we're just looking at the poor column. That's what we're given. What's the probability they're male? Well, there's 46 of them out of 58. So, 46 out of 58. So, there's a difference between saying, you know, what's the probability male, you know, male and poor? That's different from male given poor. Given poor, you look just at what you're given, and so it'd be that. And that, as it turns out, what is that? 46 divided by 58. And so, um, so you'd say 46 divided by 58. As it turns out, that's like 0.793. Of course, once again, you don't approximately 0.793. You don't have to write the decimal, but you do have to write the fraction. Okay, number four. If you know someone is female, What's the probability they said good? All right, if you, that's another conditional, and it's, an, it's just like that. It's another way of saying, you know, given someone is female, what's the probability they're good? So it's the same, the same concept as number three. So given they're female, in other words, given they're in this row here, it's one of these 130 people, all right, what's the probability they said good? Well, it's 38 of them. So you would say, well, that'd be 38 over what I'm given, which is the 130, and there you go. And that would be showing your work there, and that's like 0.2923. Um, and then lastly, another little probability preview. If you randomly select three people from the table, what's the probability they're all females? Well, let's think about this. Now, there's a total of 130 females in the table out of 225 people. So the probability the first one is gonna be female, there's 130 possibilities over 225. So that is in essence, if you randomly select one of the people from the table, they'll be female. But in general, when we do something like this, we do not use replacement. In other words, we do not put the person back in and there's still 225 people. We're not using replacement. So we just took someone off out of the group. So there's only 224 people left. We just took someone out and that person was a female. So that means there's only 129 females left. 
All right. Well, now we're selecting a third person. Given the first two are females, what's the probability the third one's going to be female? Well, there's only 223 people left, and there's only 128 females. So the probability of a multiple event of three things happening, you multiply them. You multiply them. That times that times that, and that, as it turns out, would be 0 0.19099. There you go. That's your little preview of, of descriptive stats and also a little bit of probability. Thanks for watching, and have a, have a great day.